Thank you very much, uh, Mariama, for joining me today on Migrant Stories, Tales from the Gambia Diaspora, a show where we bring on Gambians who are living abroad to share their stories and their experiences with us. Uh, we cast focus on their trials, uh, their businesses. We're very excited about those and their triumphs. And uh, today, what I'm so excited about uh, sharing with you on this platform is how we raise our kids abroad. Uh, it's very important because uh, our backgrounds in the Gambia or as Africans is very different from what we found here in terms of our values, our culture, our traditions, etc. You want to raise your kids in a way that uh, allow them to stay in touch with who they are and where they are from uh, by instilling in them the values that you espouse. Uh, but that can be very difficult in an environment where there are so many influences from the people they interact with, from their environment. Uh, I have personally witnessed uh, families raising their kids, and I see uh, the extent to which they go to uh, allowing their kids to have the connection to who they really are, to their religion, for example, how they're able to train them on um, the Islamic teachings or the our kind of Christianity, for example. Uh, so I'm excited to talk to you about that. Uh, you being a psychologist, there's a chance that you work with families uh, and you work with couples who are raising kids. And you're also a mother, you have kids uh, and uh, you have your own personal experience in this regard as well. So before we get into uh, those, uh, that aspect of why we are here today. I would like you to introduce yourself, who you are, and the kind of job that you are into. Thank you so much, Nima. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Mariama Samate. Um, well, I am from Gambia, of course, and I am from um, originally from Kiang. My That's parents something that also Kiang. excites me. <laughs> Yeah, my parents are from Kiang. <laughs> yeah. I hope nobody Bunka is watching us. Uh, but yeah, my parents are from <laughs> are from Kiang, and I was uh, raised in Bekama. Um, so I, you know, I went to my nursery school, elementary, and uh, mm -hmm. um, all in Bekama. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I attended Nusrat High School from there, and then Gambia High. And yeah. so I came, I came to the US in the night in the late nineties. Uh, so, I, so I've been here for a while yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think you are very right. Uh, it is uh, very difficult to raise children here because there are different aspects of mm -hmm. um, raising children uh, compared to that in the, Gam in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, there are some commonalities, but there are uh, a lot of times the differences are more uh, apparent. Yeah. Um, so, and it, it it is not easy because, as you said, uh, if you talk in terms of just the religion, mm -hmm. um, this is a much more is a is a Christian. I would I would say about eighty to eighty five percent. I don't know the statistics, but I'm thinking a lot of people here in the U.S. Um, are Christians, uh, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but you have other de denominations, but the large majority of people are, are Christians, and so. Um, you know, yes, they have they you know they have their values. They have their value system. They the religions that they um, you know that they practice. But then that is completely that's very different from Islam. You know, yes, there are Muslims in 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 the U.S. and there are certain states that have a lot of more um, I think religious. Uh, I'm sorry, Muslim community mm -hmm. than yeah. than where, where I am. Mm -hmm. But a lot of communities here, um, you find it very difficult where, like in the Gambia, where everywhere you go, you would see a mosque, you would see, you know, people praying, you would see people covering their heads. Yeah. Um, you don't see much of that here. So when it comes to Islam, we try to instill in our children the things that we know, the things that we do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew, um, you know, there were, I was in a different state before I came to uh, the 
before I came to Florida, mm -hmm. it was very difficult for me to even find a, a chronic teacher for my children. Yeah. So that was that was a challenge. Um, and uh, in here, it it's so difficult that if you yourself are not very religious, your mm -hmm. children can can you know tend to they tend to not know your religion that much, right? Yeah. yeah. But let, for, let me start us, from a very personal place. Uh, mm -hmm. First, with a question. How many kids do you have that were born here in the US? Right. So I have four kids. Um, mm -hmm. and my kids are uh, I have one boy and uh, three three girls. Mm -hmm. Um, so the boy, of course, he is now he graduated, he's now in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I have two um two high schoolers and um, and one elementary school, a 10 year old. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that I have I have four kids. Yeah. yeah. So what has been your biggest experience with raising those kids? It's not been easy. Um, I would say parenting is not, there is no rule book for parenting and especially in the United States, right? Oh, I know. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, for, um, even for children that are from the same parents, mm -hmm. um, you know, from parenting differs from child to child because mm -hmm. uh, every um, child um, kind of, uh, they, they receive or they are receptive to discipline differently, right? Yeah. So um, what you do for based off of my own experience and things that I've been doing with my children mm -hmm. is to be able to know your children and know that, you know, if I go this way with my with this particular child, or if I choose this particular parenting with this particular child, it's going to go well. So I start by, but I think that come also comes from my, um, I would say my training as a psychotherapist, right? Um, yeah. it, it, it comes from that training to learn who your children are and know how to uh, raise them and know how to discipline them. Um, because as you probably know, uh, disciplining your kids is not is not something that you know is very well. You discipline your kids, but there are certain specific things you can do. You cannot do in this in the United States. You can do in the Gambia, but not here. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it very very difficult sometimes to even raise your children. Mm -hmm. But for me, I take it day by day, and I take it child by child. My relationship with um, each of my children is different because each of them is different from the other person. Mm -hmm. um, so I look at their strengths, I look at their their weaknesses, and I use that to be able to parent them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i'm you know doing all that i also have a partner who is kind of you know help me in this regard right their father is here and he balances me out because i am the parent that is like let's do this yelling all through throughout the day i'm yelling at them <laughs> throughout the day i'm uh, you know i'm kind of like hyper hyperventilating all the time but yeah. he's 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 the calming force behind all my hyperventilation right so when i'm hyperventilating he's calm and i think that gave us the balance um, to be able to raise uh, our children uh, the best way we know how yeah um, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very insightful uh, experience that you share, uh, that parenting is something I am learning is something that you invest in uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's deliberate. It's not something that happens by chance. You need to know every child individually and how you approach uh, mm -hmm. them. But another thing uh, that makes it a deliberate uh, act here in the U.S. or elsewhere is the fact that the differences that exist in terms of what what we have back home and what we have here. Back home, we say it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. Every individual, especially those who are related to you, have some sort of uh, some sort of responsibility towards your child and how they turn out. Here, it's more like mm -hmm. an individual activity. It's you and your kids at home. Everything they do is upon you. But also there are structures that... For example, the legal provisions that exist in terms of child rights, which are very prominent in the West than they are back home, uh, that also limit the extent to which you can discipline your child. For example, corporal punishment. 
uh, mm -hmm. which may be allowed back home, but it's not necessarily allowed here. What are some of the ways through which you are able to circumvent these structures that exist? Child protection laws, uh, children being aware of all the rights that are available to them, and uh, the fact that you are careful not to get yourself into trouble with the way you, you would discipline your child as if you were back home. What sort of ways do you circumvent these structures? I think, again, it goes back to, you know, the, 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 your children, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I know, you know, being in that even um, my profession is very well connected to the child protective laws and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it is important to me that, you know, I know what those lo laws are um, mm -hmm. so that we can prevent ourselves from getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. But for me, and, and I will talk to, from my own um, experience, because like I said, parenting is very individual, is individualized. And, uh, you know, from one household to another, how people parent is very different. And there is no um, one good way of parenting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have to look at what works for you and you do that. So mm -hmm. for us, I think is we start with, um, and when I say us, meaning myself and my husband, we start mm -hmm. with inculcating in our kids the values that we aspire, right? Uh, who we are as a person, how we, what are we are values? values. I'm really interested in knowing <laughs> what set of values are you trying to instill mm -hmm. in your kids? Right. So first of all, you know, we we let we instill in them the knowledge that even though they are born here, uh, they were born here, they have an immigrant background and that and the immigrant story is very important. And I'm glad you said your your yeah. your program is immigrant <laughs> stories. So yeah. we tell them I spend a lot of time telling my children how you know what it takes to bring me to, to come to this country, right? Yeah. And since I come came to this country, what I have to do to be where I am today. Um, so, so those stories, I am, you know, we're hoping that uh, instills in them um, hard work, right? Dedication to one's, uh, you know, being respectful of other people. Because if you come to somebody else's country and you don't respect their laws, rules and regulations, then mm -hmm. you're going to get yourself in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. So respecting um, the, the, the laws of the land and be respectful to author authority, mm -hmm. we teach them that. We also teach them the fact that you have to be able to pull yourself up by the bootstrings because mm -hmm. uh, we came here with nothing, right? Yeah. And so if we can come here with nothing, Thing and be able to achieve a lot mm -hmm. and to be where we are today mm -hmm. that means a lot it means you have to be invested in everything that you do in order to be able to uh, reap the benefits later on so yeah. uh, being being invested um having that motivation and initiative to get up and do and do work uh, mm -hmm. is very important but most importantly that we have a dean the dean mm -hmm. that we follow right and and this is what we do on a daily basis uh what i do understand not from my perspective as a mother but from my perspective as a psychotherapist mm -hmm. is that children don't learn um, by uh, you talking to them and saying these type of things they have to see you do it yeah. And most of these things that I'm talking about every day, they are seeing us do it, do what, uh, do those things. So no, Alhamdulillah, teach by example. Exactly, exactly. So Alhamdulillah, they are learning from us. But uh, one thing you said is very important, which is in in the Gambia, raising your children is a uh, uh, is a is a community endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just you. You, yeah, for me, I know when I was growing up in the Gambia, um, mm -hmm. you know. I know if I do something at my house and I'm going to I'm going to get in trouble. If I do the same thing at my friend's uh, house, I'm going to get in trouble. M my friend's mother or my friend's father is going to treat me the same way like my my parents would. If I want to do anything, they know my parents values. They, you know, they know everything about us, whereas that is not prevalent here. Um, mm -hmm. Parenting in America is very individualistic. From household to household, values are different. Aspirations are different. So you have to, every time your child goes out, you don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't know whether what you instill in your child, she or he or she is going to be manifested outside of the home. Yeah. So uh, yes, it takes a lot of um, paying attention to your children, uh, being able to tell your children stories uh, for them to understand your sacrifice and letting them know them being born in this country is a privilege for them because that's one of the reasons why we came here right, that's right. Uh, yeah. and and but also they even though they were born here they they have 
they, they have parents who migrated to this country who come from different cultures, different backgrounds, and that culture and background is also part of their culture, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's why when when it is time for um, you know the eats, we will we will we will do <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we will do uh, we will we will go to the mosque and then do everything that we try to not everything, but we try mm -hmm. to do what we what, what we do back home yeah. to try to practice that here. So yeah. um, we do when it's time to when Ramadan, we make them fast. You know when prayer times, let's pray. So yeah. these are the kind of things that we do. Now, we don't have a lot of reinforcements in terms of when they leave the, the house. For instance, my son, when he went to college, mm -hmm. you know, every single day I'm talking to him. Did you pray? Did you? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? He can tell me yes, but is he doing it over there? I don't know. But I do pray that, you know, while, while he was here, I mm -hmm. gave him everything. We gave him everything that he needs to mm -hmm. be able to prosper uh, and to be able to follow. Yeah. You know, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah. brilliant. Uh, another yeah. thing that I have noticed to be the my, to be migrants' uh, struggle is mm -hmm. to make sure that your kids at all times stay connected to their roots. And I know every individual has a different approaches to how they do this. For example, I am learning that uh, with my daughter who is just one, to speak to her only in Mandinka. Because I know mm -hmm. if she grows up in an environment like this, chances are that she's going to speak English anyways. She doesn't yeah. need me to be her teacher, her English mm -hmm. teacher. But she needs me to be her Mandinka teacher. And hopefully, I am thinking in my mind that if she grows learning Mandinka at home, there are chances that she would be able to communicate with uh, our families back home when she grows up because I've seen I don't know I'm not saying that other people are not doing that but I've, I've seen a lot of kids who only speak English and they're not able to speak Mandinka or Wolof or Fula and uh, not that their parents are not trying but you would hope that your kids would speak your local language especially when they interact with their families are there ways that you are deliberately trying to make sure that your kids stay connected to their root and that they do not lose, lose that contact with their family back home um i will be honest with you if there's one thing i failed at <laughs> yeah. that is where i failed as a parent <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is where i failed as it's a parent. struggle it for was, a lot of people it was really hard it is really hard yeah. um because you're teaching these children your language but everywhere else that they go to uh, english language is speaking you know it's spoken people speak english language or oh, it's spoken and mm -hmm. so it, it becomes very difficult now you know you, you are like okay do i keep speaking mandinka or mm -hmm. do i or, or or do i tell them mandinka here yes, and then when we are outside i speak english right yes. so it's yes. so confusing it's so difficult sometimes i just resort to just speaking english and that yes. i still regret yes. um you know I, I you know but there are families who are very good at you know being able to you know switch from mandinka to english when they can and their children, uh, their children are very are able to speak Mandinka and are able to, you know, you know, they speak English, of course, mm -hmm. but are able to speak both languages fluently. Mm -hmm. um, for for me, that wasn't um, because I think I had a lot on my plate. I I, I you know, it was a lot mm -hmm. because if I had, if I'm speaking to them in English here, if I go, let's go to the grocery store in mm -hmm. order to uh, not kind of draw some attention to me i'm gonna to speak to them in english language right yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna be speaking my you know maybe you only speak mandinka at home so yeah. i feel at that i feel miserably at that because <laughs> I, I kept speaking english to them and yes it's um you know they when my people when they call when we call home yeah. my sisters my sister because I, I lost both, both my parents but my sisters uh oh. two sisters are there mm -hmm. yeah so they will be speaking to them in mandinka and they will be going back and forth so there will be some translation going on you yeah. know in my sister's end her children will be translating you know and then they will talk yeah. but i told myself i said you know because i raise them to know that they are from this part of the world uh, not that they are from this part of the world but their parents are from there and that's because their parents are from there that's also their origin mm -hmm. uh, at some point you know when they go they mm -hmm. will be invested in you know trying to know their language trying to you know speak their language and and, and things like that my yeah. children don't know um, you know, even though they are born here, know a lot about the Gambia through us, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and they, you know, I was 
you know, when Jame was there at one point, um, I think there was something on the news about Gambia. You could, you would see how they came to me, explain, do you know, <laughs> you know, they were explaining to me what the TV presenter was saying, you yeah. know, about Jame. I, that was the, during the, I think it was during the impasse. Yeah. yeah. So they came to me, they were, they're very invested the same mm -hmm. way they're invested when Muslim things come up, you know, mm -hmm. they will be talking about, you know, like, kind of like an activist in that regard, right? Mm -hmm. Muslims, yeah. this, Muslims, that, you know. And, and because they are exposed to so social media, they see these mm -hmm. things there and they will come to me and, you know, talk mm -hmm. to me about it. So, yes, I I, I feel miserably in yeah. trying to teach them. <laughs> I'm language. sure it's not, it's not lack right. of uh, trying. Right. Uh, I, have, right. I have seen families right. here who only speak their language to their kids, even though the yeah. kids understand them, but they will only respond in English. English, so, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's yeah, that's a, that's we can try that's as hard as we want, but it's it's still a challenge, it's a struggle. It yeah. is, it is, it is. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I have experienced, uh, I mean, interacting with other migrants, especially here in the U.S., is the efforts that they take to make sure that their kids learn the Quran. Even though, like you said, in certain areas, uh, especially where you are or some other people are. It's very hard to come across symbols of Islam, such as mm -hmm. a mosque or a Quran school. You go to a great lens as parents to ensure that your kids have access to these teachings. I've seen people who are soliciting um, lecturers or teachers from across the Middle East, for example, in Africa, and allowing uh, their kids to learn the Quran through uh, technology, for example, through over Zoom etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this is something that you guys do as parents or if you know anyone else who does this, how or to what extent or to what length do you go as a parent or people that you interact with to get their, uh, their children um, access to Islamic teaching? Right. Uh, that's a very important point you, you raised because we had an issue with that. Like I said, um, the state that I was before I came to Florida, it was difficult to find a Quranic teacher. So my children at that time were using the Internet. They would go online to learn the Quran. Mm -hmm. um, but thankfully, when I came here and even when I came here in the beginning, it was difficult to find anyone um, mm -hmm. to teach my children. And then I was able to find a Quranic school here mm -hmm. um, to send my kids. But that Quranic school was more expensive than mm -hmm. the regular school that the elementary school they go to you know yeah. um and so at some point you know i i take them out of that school and 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 thankfully i had an one this one nigerian lady mm -hmm. who i met I, we met up somewhere and in, in a, well i take my kids to the library so we met met up at the library mm -hmm. um she had the hijab on and i asked her, i said are you you muslim and she said yes i'm like do you you teach the quran she said you see yeah yeah i i know the quran i you know i can read the quran and write and she said yeah then that you know she became my my children's quranic teacher she's still in our life mm -hmm. um uh, lives and, um, you know, she would from even now, now they are not going like how they used to, mm -hmm. um, especially the ones that are in high school. But they would call her once in a while and she will uh, teach them. I also have a, a, a sister in law. I don't know how sister in law, Pechargo, yeah. uh, who, who also who also is very, uh, you know, very um, she can read the Arabic test very well. Mm -hmm. um, so she too was teaching my children at one, at one point. So yeah. I, I am blessed that way, but I do mm -hmm. know it's a struggle. A lot of people find it very difficult to mm -hmm. find Quranic um, scholars. And we, most of us become creative by using the internet mm -hmm. uh, to, teach our, to teach our kids. Yes, mm -hmm. it, it is challenging. But now that in this internet age, it's becoming easier than it used to be. That's when right. I first came here, yeah. Yeah. So now let's bring focus on your work as a psychotherapist. Uh, I am mm -hmm. hoping that you work with families as well, uh, not yes. just couple, and mm -hmm. those of Gambian background as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I am interested in knowing what generally parents experience in terms of uh, their children's behavior, how that gets influenced by peer influence, for example, or substance abuse or whatever else is out there that is influencing them, Western culture or anything of that nature. Do you have in your line of work people who come to you 
with these kind of problems with their kids? Yeah, all day, every day. Uh, and But these are not usually just, um, you know, uh, migrants, um, but even people from here, mostly people from here. But I do have a few migrant, um, um, you know, families that I have worked with um, throughout my, you know, my career. It is very, um, I wouldn't say common among the migrant families, because to be honest with you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know a whole, you know, all the migrant, you know, because when you say migrant, it in, in includes all Africans who come here and even yeah. people from the West Indies who come here. <laughs> so it's a, we, America has, a, it's a melting pot. So it has yeah. a lot of migrants. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the migrant issues that I see when it comes to my work mm -hmm. uh, are not usually Africans. Um, and I'm not saying Africans are not, you don't have Africans who encounter that, but they are, you know, migrants from other countries around the world that, you know, are, you know, dealing with, uh, like you said, substance abuse issues, are dealing with the law, because uh, um, people come to us, sometimes the courts would order people to come to the therapist uh, in order for them to deal with certain things. And, and that doesn't only mean, um, you know, the drug issue. So um, I see a lot of that. I see a lot of um, migrants, uh, people who uh, their parents migrate here, and um, these kids are getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. And now i wouldn't just it's just not a migrant issue i think it's an issue of where you live right um yeah. the environment in in which you live uh peer pressure peer influence like you said um and the availability of drugs and other type of uh, substances uh in that area yeah. that is what det what determines sometimes and also um, and also because you have parents uh, who are present in the household, but they are still absent because they have a lot of work to do, right? Yeah. Um, some, you know, if you are a parent like me, you go in the morning, you don't come back till like 9 p.m. at, you know, at night. So your children are left to their own devices if they don't have the other parent in the house yeah. to take care of them while you are away. So when they are left to their own devices, only God knows what they do, you know? So um, most of some migrant families that I have been working with are uh, faced with that type of difficulty. They are single, single uh, parent households mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they leave their children, you know, to themselves, go to work mm -hmm. and then come back. And, you know, they you know, that's how they get uh, astray, getting into yeah. problems, dealing with, you know, people on the street, in the street corners, you know, and different kind of things that influence them. Um, and they end up in the court system. So when yeah. they end up in the court system, that's when we get them. Um, and uh, sometimes their parents would even make the effort to try to get them therapy before, um, before you know, they can even get in trouble. So, yeah. um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of issues that people deal with here uh, mm -hmm. that um, sometimes are not, you know, it's not that the parent is not trying. Failing, the parent yeah. is trying is the, and the parent is failing. The parent mm -hmm. is not. It's just mm -hmm. that, um, you know, what we are used to back home, the way, the, our way of life, how we, um, you know, on a day to day, how we live life is very different from here. Right. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> You know, I don't used to know a whole lot about bills, pay this bill, pay that bill until I came to America. Right. I'm like, what is this? It's like every time you get your money, you give it all and you sit down. Right. Um, and, and so those pressures of paying bills makes it very difficult for certain families to um, be able to be at home and be in their children's lives and, and, and do the best for them. So that is a huge challenge here. And, and that's you know, one of the reasons why I am, I come across a lot of uh, kids that I used to work with, uh, and I still work with, who are immigrants and who are also Americans. Yeah. Um, I'm glad because, you brought this up, though, because this is something that uh, has been on my mind a lot as well, in terms of how work in the American economy, for example, keeps parents away from their kids. A yeah. lot of the time, even when you are working from home, you hardly have the time to dedicate to your kid. Uh, right. And their main uh, interactor becomes their laptop or their, uh, their tablet. Uh, is there any resultant effect from this kind of situation where kids spend a lot of time on the screen than they do with their parents? Yeah, yeah. That's basically it. You know, it's like they spend 
and and most of their influences most of the uh, peer pressure you are talking about is usually <laughs> before when you say peer pressure you are thinking about schools right or you are thinking about playgrounds or you know where they go movies mm -hmm. but that's not the case anymore peer pressure yeah. now is online is online mm -hmm. and you know i have in my line of work i have seen children where who are meeting up with drug dealers online right uh they they meeting with meeting with them online and then they will you know kind of arrange to meet somewhere else to go mm -hmm. and get drugs from drug dealers yeah so imagine if you have a, a kid and no parent at home parents are working uh what's gonna happen you know when that kid is home by themselves you know yeah. um who knows they could be even calling the drug dealer to say i don't have a car can you come over here Mm -hmm. you know before you know it a drug dealer is knocking on your door and selling your your child drugs yeah. so it is a very scary scary situation um and like i said not you know it, that is lingering in the back of our minds every time mm -hmm. but not only that because america is also a society where gun violence is all over the place mm -hmm. um that too every single time that your children leave the house you you know you have at the back of your mind you're praying that they come mm -hmm. back home they sure. come back home safe and sound so um you know having children in this country has a lot of advantages but mm -hmm. it does also have a, a, a lot of uh disadvantages yeah. and the disadvantages is most more so the fact that it's an individualistic society where you have to do everything for your family you have to be the one in your family's life and your neighbor yeah. your neighbor your neighbor will not be watching for you and mm -hmm. even if your neighbor is watching for you your neighbor is not going to get involved right mm -hmm. as you would um uh, as you would like i was telling you in the beginning mm -hmm. if i was doing something bad in the streets of gambia my mm -hmm. family friends my my family friends will can, I can, whoop you on the street <laughs> exactly they would whoop me on the on the streets to make yeah. sure that i'm not doing what i'm doing over mm -hmm. here you don't have that so you don't have that so every time your child leaves the house mm -hmm. you are praying that they come back safe and, safe and sound safe yeah. and sound but you are also praying that they are able to not forget the values that you instill in them, that mm -hmm. they could still be able to, you know, um, utilize those values and do and, and be who they are mm -hmm. in the streets. So yeah. that's that, that that is very important. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But knowing that certain uh, individuals may not necessarily have the luxury to be as present as they want with their kids, the screen becomes their, uh, their ultimate uh, friend in the house. Is there any way that parents can be advised to do or what they can be advised to do to minimize the harm that their yeah. the, the children can be exposed to? Right. So there are so many different things, creative ways that they can do that. Uh, one of the things that you know I always talk to families about is um, to kind of have a parental control on your on the laptops uh whether it's the laptop or the phone or whatever any mm -hmm. electronic device that you have thankfully now you can link up with your service provider and have a parent parental control on it mm -hmm. that will kind of guide your children as to the sites that you want them to visit mm -hmm. um so so that's one thing yeah. uh, uh, and another thing i i think mainly is you start your children with not exposing them to the electronics more yeah. but you try to expose them to things that will keep them engaged um engaged instead of the electronics yeah. uh playing board playing board games playing you know doing going out um you know getting involved in activities that are outside of the tv or electronics mm -hmm. those are the things that can sustain them um if you don't want them to be to have that screen time that long screen time that you, you know kids are usually exposed to here you know because if it is the gambia uh yeah i do know now gambia a lot of kids also have you know phones and things like that mm -hmm. but at least gambia when now it goes off your phone is off right, yeah. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> you know so, or you don't have i mean you, you don't right. have any so when megabytes. now it yeah. says bye-bye your phone yeah. is going bye-bye you know <laughs> unless <laughs> unless you got it fully charged right yeah. Yeah. but over here we have electricity 24 hours a day seven days a week you know so um, the most, right right mm -hmm. so the most important thing is to introduce your children to things that are not you know um you know electronics um mm -hmm. you know there are so many things that you can do with your children that is not centered around you know being on uh, uh, on the computer 
And mm-hmm. that's what I do encourage a lot of families to do when they come to me, mm-hmm. um, especially with children that have um, mental health disorders like ADHD, disruptive mm-hmm. behavior. When they come, you know, those are the type of things that we encourage them to engage in instead of just, you know, leaving them to themselves with their laptops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much for these amazing uh, insights that you're sharing with us. Uh, my final question that I would like to ask is working with families. And like you have mentioned, it's not easy living abroad, trying to make a living, trying to take care of everybody, everybody back home and being the only person or just you and your partner taking care of kids who have influences everywhere from technology, uh, from their friends. Uh, you don't have as much control over them as you would want. And you're only hoping that your efforts go a long way in creating the person that is beneficial to themselves and to society. Uh, What do you think is a parent's biggest fear living in the United States from a different background, say from a Gambian background, for example? What is a parent's biggest fear in the face of all this gun violence that is happening, uh, exposure to drug? exposure to all kinds of negative negativity that ex, uh, exists within our environment yeah what is your fear yeah, yeah. Uh, for me i think my fear is um every single day i wake up i pray that my kids come back home safe right um, um that is my biggest fear because gun violence in america doesn't you know, no, any, it has no boundaries, right? Okay. You can be in, a, it doesn't know any safe neighborhood, um, whether you are, whether you live in a safe neighborhood, in an affluent neighborhood, or you live in a poor neighborhood. Um, gun violence is everywhere. So um, that is my major, major, major concern. I pray every day that, you know, my kids can come home safe and, they, you know, all our children can come home safe. Um, but um, another major thing concern for me is um, how do we um, kind of help our children know the dean? Um, because that's also very important. Um, it's yes. something that, you know, it has it has been very challenging for me. Uh, it's something that I, you know, I try my best to make sure that, you know, this is something that is a priority for us. Uh, how do we get them to know the dean? How do we get them to stick with the dean, right? So it's one thing to know the dean, but it's another to stick with it. So that is, um, that th- that's a, my a major concern. But, you know, from my perspective as a parent, I think there are only three, th- very three things that I, as a parent, um, you know, if I if I can tell you, I have a rule book that that that's what that would be. Yeah. I make sure that I teach my children. I am their biggest cheerleader, right? Mm-hmm. I make sure that I teach them um, mm-hmm. and um, to to be confident in themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Because one thing uh, it's very uh, evident in America: you, if you cannot be confident, if you don't have a good a good end of self esteem, mm-hmm. it's very difficult to be able to you know. Um, strive here yeah kind of yeah strive or even um be be able to hold a job and hold on to it right Mm -hmm. so um or maybe climb up the ladder you know or maybe you know so having that confidence is very important right so i i i am their cheerleader i tell them i Anything that they, I teach them in my household, like like I told you before, with the help of my husband, uh, mm-hmm. to know the things that they can do, to be uh, self-sufficient. What mm-hmm. can you do? Can you live on your own without me? Right. Mm-hmm. And those are the things that we teach them. Um, things like being able to as- assemble furniture, being, yeah. able, be, being able to paint paint I, I never paid anybody to paint my house my yeah. children and myself we pay we paint the house um you know being able to cook my son is a very good cook anyone who has him as a wife as a husband <laughs> you will be happy <laughs> you will be happy because he, he cooks you know he cooks he he paints he assembles furniture he you know he does a whole lot of things right yeah. so self-sufficiency is very important for us it's important that we child our uh, we teach our children to be self-sufficient but it's also very important for for us to uh, let them know you can have yes 
you can also have all these skills, but you also have to get some edu education to go with that, right? Mm -hmm. You do not have to be, uh, you know, like an Ivy, Ivy League uh, school educated. If you are, that will be good, right? But if you are not, you just need the basic education to be able to move you from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. So education, being self-sufficient um, be, and also being their, um, their cheerleader to help them have that confidence in, the, in themselves and build up their self-esteem be able to kind of voice out their feelings, uh, what is going on with them, you know, kind of express what you are feeling inside. A yeah. lot of times we are, we are good at expressing, you know, our wants uh, and our needs, but we are not able to express our feelings. And, and that is usually what leads to uh, bad behavior, what leads to, uh, you know, anger issues, what leads to things that usually can be so displacing. So yes, uh, we made it our responsibility to teach them um, to be able to, um, you know, voice out their, you know, their concerns and, you know, how they are feeling and what's going on with them. So yes. those are things that I do. And so I'm not fearful about if you are, if you don't have, con because they are not confident. And if they go out there, they will uh, be bullied by other kids. Yeah. That's not my concern because even if they are bullied, I know they can stand up for themselves. Right. <laughs> um, and so there, as parents, there are things that you can do to equip your, your children so that when they go out there, mm -hmm. they can be able to fend for themselves and that is very important we don't have control over everything we can't yeah. we can't we can't kind of uh, you know uh, cover them from all everything else that could happen to them but yeah. at least if you can instill in them the confidence the self-esteem mm -hmm. um you know you can instill in them you know kind of teach them things that they will be able to live on their own with because this is an individualistic society you know sure. kids will uh, one day leave the house and they will go somewhere and if they can't do x y and z on their own That's guess what, what? they're gonna yeah. they're gonna want to call somebody to come and not everybody comes with good intentions you know yeah. so it is very um, important that you are teaching them that self-sufficiency um you know and also respect just mm -hmm. respect people um, um give respect but also expect respect back right so if yeah. i if i am respecting you you need to respect me back and and that is not something that people are born with you have yeah. to teach your you have to teach your children to be able to uh, give respect but be able to expect respect back back for themselves as well yeah. so that is a valuable advice there that's something that we don't know to be uh, something that kids deserve from us. We always re expect respect, but we are not expecting to give it in return. Um, I yeah, was going yeah. to ask, as my final question, what your advice would be to other parents who are in similar situation, who are also migrants, Gambian migrants for that matter. But it looks like you summed up everything that you would advise somebody to do. And one, I just want to summarize what you've just said is to instill self-esteem in your kids, to teach them how to be confident, to teach them life skills so that they can be uh, self-reliant wherever they are, knowing that their parents are not always going to be there for them, but to also respect them as you expect them to respect you, to be their home so that when they have, uh, when they are feeling bad, when they're feeling sad, when they're feeling uh, any kind of emotions, you will be the person they come to with those emotions because that can be very detrimental for a, for a kid's growth when they don't know where to go to with their feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, unless you have something else to say, this has been a very valuable conversation that I had with you. I was not expecting it to take this turn, and it did. Uh, I hope that our audience are going to learn something from it and they can resonate with uh, what you have shared with us. Uh, right. Do, do you have anything else to add? No, I, I was just going to say I, I wasn't even trying to um, kind of, um, you know, give advice to any parent because, like I said, um, um, you know, parenting is very is is very individualistic, even from one child to another. And so this is what this is what works for me. I'm just sharing, you know, what works for me. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, other parents, you know, when they have the opportunity to talk about these issues, will give you amazing That's things, really amazing different. things. Yeah, that they do with their children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, it could enrich us. So for me, uh, maybe coming from a background of a psychotherapist, mm -hmm. those are the things that are 
important to me, um, yeah. you know, and, and coming from a, that background, also seeing children coming in for therapy, for um, self-esteem issues, for uh, lack of confidence, for uh, coming in because they don't, they are out there, you know, they went to college or they went, they, li- they started living on their own, but mm-hmm. they don't know how to live on their own, right? Um, yeah. Those are important things. I think um, day-to-day things that I see in my job that also encourages me to try to teach my children that because if not one child can come to me and say I need help with this the, the, it's only um, kind of wise that I go back home and teach the same thing to my to my own so yeah yeah these are things that I do and I'm hoping that um, you know other families or other you know parents can um, learn from it but um, we are all you know good parents in one way or another mm-hmm. uh, and we are we are also parents that also struggle right because um, you know parenting is not easy um, and it's you don't you don't have all the answers right be open to other parents as well be open to listen to other parents what they do and learn from them um that has enriched me a lot because even the kids that come to me every time they come and i ask them so what have you what have you done that had worked for you right Mm -hmm. what you you had all these problems but there must be something that you have done that worked for you and they will tell me what worked for them and some of those things i try to incorporate in my own uh, children's lives Mm -hmm. so it's a learning it's a learning opportunity every single time um that you sit with parents or you sit with um um, you know families um in general to talk about you know things experiences that they go through so um, i'm 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 very happy for the opportunity to share mine. <laughs> yeah, I am yeah. so happy to have you here and sharing yeah. your experiences with us and your, your work with us. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you so much for being on Migrant Stories Tales from the Gambia Diaspora. We will catch okay. up on some other topics, hopefully, <laughs> in the future. Yeah. <laughs> for now, thank right. you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nima. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank You're you welcome. for the program. All right. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>